Eigen Steer, really a fisherman, an operator, tuna operator. I came from humble beginnings. I came from a very, very tough upbringing. Uh, I love your know, running fleet, which is highly successful. And we come, it wasn't always like that, yeah? We had to take the hard yards also. That's what makes it, that makes it all worthwhile, that we, I can leave a legacy for everyone for the future. In 1960, the eyewall from the Foreign Legion and uh, was lucky to uh, be able to uh, get a job on a ship and uh, I finished up in Port Lincoln. In those days, like and we're talking about the early 60s, that it was a fairly wild town and I loved it. I thought it was great. I stayed here, worked various jobs around town and that was at the start of the tuna industry. It was a job for men, let me tell you. That was, uh, it was fairly rough and ready, and uh, I loved it actually. It was, it was tough. The vessels weren't very big. That was the start of the tuna industry. Yeah? I remember the days when we, uh, when we uh, got 76 ton, 76 ton of tuna in five and a half hours with six men. In, in those days, it was like the Battle of Britain. We had up to 12 to 13 airplanes in the air. All the different companies had different airplanes and stuff like that. We, kept, we caught a lot of fish. Huh? We caught a lot of fish, huh? thousands and thousands and thousands of tons. And the science community thought that uh, we were overcatching it. The rest of the world were saying we were overcatching it. That's when we thought, well, we've got to come up with something new. We've got to do some value adding of some sort. That's when we came up with the, with the, with the ingenious idea of go tuna farming. That was uh, the now quite famous Cappuccino Club. We actually virtually started it. Tuna farming in the world was established here in Portland. I very often get paid three handsome blokes in the same time. I saw this good looking, good looking girl and I thought, geez, I would like to take her out, and I was there. Yeah. I was 18, and um, I was in my father's dry cleaners just to collect a few clothes of my own, and he asked if I'd like to go out that night, and I said, no, no, I've got to work. But that night, there was a knock on the door, and it, it was Hague, and he said, are you ready? Are you ready to go out? And I said, I'm not going out with you. And he said, yes, you are. No, I'm not. And then in a moment I was on the telephone ringing my father saying, a friend of mine needs me to help her with studies. Do you mind if I don't come to the shop and work tonight? So that was the start of a very rocky courtship. Years after, my, my, my son, we had, we had a son, and of course I was on the altar with my, my father-in-law. And the day I made a son, I was, I was the number one uh, son-in-law. Today my son is almost in command of the stair group, gradually taking over from his father. And my daughter is a pilot and she began her career fish spotting for her father as well. I've always loved the sea and loved the fishing industry and, and I used to do all sorts of fishing with him. I would go abalone diving with, with my father and then, then I would go prawn fishing with him. And then, um, and then after that I, we sort of, um, Went, went over to the, to the tuna polling boat. You know what, that's one thing, if I miss something, I wish my parents would have pushed me to learn the organ when I uh, uh, learned the, uh, yeah. the piano. I, I, I wish I would have been a little bit more culturally wise. I only started learning about a few months ago. But you just got to get onto it all the time, eh? at least 20 minutes, 30 minutes every day. I love it. Yeah. I can play a few Yankee Doodle and clock tower belts or something like that. But... He drives around in his Jeep. I mean, that's ever, it's common knowledge to everyone because General Patton in the, in the American